Good evening. It's good to be with you tonight. I'm Bishop Mark Bartosik. I'm one of the auxiliary bishops of Chicago, and I'm very happy to be with you here at St. Juliana and to have been asked. You know, uh, we have been meeting with the pastors in the vicariate for the last uh, six to eight weeks. We have a formal meeting every year. And one after another, uh, the guys have been telling us, me and my deans, that they're very grateful for the creativity of their staffs and the people in their parishes, for the ability to roll with all of the changes and all of the challenges of the last year, uh, the adaptability, the flexibility, the patience, all of those things have made a deep impression on uh, the priests that I deal with every day. But it's true that there's also just a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety and loss that people are dealing with in addition to uh, even more serious things like depression and sometimes a search for meaning in the midst of the loss and the difficulties that this last year has brought us. So as I thought about what I might talk about tonight, I thought I might draw a little bit on uh, my work in the Cook County Jail where people are under tremendous uncertainty and tremendous stress and uh, where at least in the places where I was ministering there aren't a whole lot of Catholics so I don't have the faith tradition uh, of most of the people that I dealt with there and I thought what does our faith have to offer them and the idea that came to me came to me through the Psalms. You know, the Psalms are Jesus' own prayer. Uh, the Psalms are the most quoted book in the Gospel. The most quoted Old Testament book in the Gospel are the Psalms. The Psalms are always on the Lord's lips. So we know that He used these beautiful po poems to pray with. And it's his voice, actually, although they were written by David and by others, since it's the Word of God, it's his voice, the voice of Jesus himself, his words that we're using when we pray the Psalms. And when we pray them over and over again, as priests and religious do, you come to see that the entire range of human experience is captured in the Psalms from a feeling of elation and, and tremendous joy and triumph to the deepest despair. And um, so I thought that maybe a, a little meditation on one of the Psalms might be helpful this evening. You know, because on the one hand, the vaccines have rolled out and people are excited about that and the election is passed and some of the emotions may be calming down and yet this year has been like none other and although it's natural I think to sometimes be so anxious for things to get back to normal the truth is that normal will never be what it was but I would say even more if this horrible pandemic, if we treat it as something to get past and then to forget about, we'll be losing an opportunity to grow deeper in love of Jesus and in trust of his providence. I was listening to the radio the other day and somebody surmised that perhaps when we finally do come out on the other side of the pandemic, there will be a, a reaction like the Roaring Twenties. It was, it was suggested that the Twenties were a response to World War I and the 1918 pandemic. 
Like we are going to forget this if it kills us. Let's not forget. Let's learn from what has been happening to us and to the world. Perhaps a hook that I'd like to put uh, the words this evening on is the idea of the fear of the Lord. It's a kind of fear that you have to learn. It's not like fear of a deadly virus. That's instinctual. We're instinctively afraid of those things or a, a, a dog with his fangs bared. Uh, but the fear of the Lord is learned. And it's very, very, very closely related to love when we're talking about God. Not when we're talking about each other. Uh, if I'm afraid of you, it's very hard to love you. But we can't love God unless we fear him in the sense that we hold him in awe and we trust him. So those are some of the things I wanted to talk about today. I want to take you on a little trip through Psalm 22, which, as you may know, is the psalm that Jesus quoted on the cross that begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me or abandoned me? And um, I want to talk about three things in the context of this psalm. And I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to talk about something that's called Christian anthropology. It's a big word, but I think you'll understand it uh, if you haven't heard of it before. And then I want to talk about another strange thing, which is called nihilism, which also sounds strange, but I think we can make sense of it. And then I want to talk about responsibility, the third thing. And then mix it up a little bit with Psalm 22. So this is a subject that really interested me very much in the seminary. The question of what is the human person? What are we? What, dif what makes us different from, you know, the cat uh, in your home or the animals in the zoo or the grass in the parkway or, or the trees or, or the water in Lake Michigan? What is the Christian view of the human person? That's called Christian anthropology. And so there are three things I want to share with you there. First of all, we are created. That's what we believe about ourselves. We didn't just happen, but we were created. We were designed. We were thought up in the mind of somebody who knew what he was doing and who created us out of love. So again, we didn't just happen. We were designed and we were brought into the world because we were loved. We were loved into being. And our first parents as well as ourselves, were created good. Not just sort of ni fu ni fa, but, but good. The one who made us looked at us and said, this is very good what I have made. But we have fallen from that original goodness. We are still good, but through our disobedience, our goodness has been lessened through sin. And it hasn't only affected us, it's affected the entire world. So, for example, in the Gospel, we'll hear the understanding that death itself was not part of God's plan for us, but is a consequence of our disobedience. We can't even imagine that. We can't imagine a world where people don't get sick. We can't imagine a world when, where there isn't tremendous pain, for example, in childbirth. We can't imagine a world in which nobody dies. But that's what we believe. That those things that make us suffer were not part of God's plan for us. They're not what he wanted. They are really the devil's work that got in through our disobedience. So the first thing is that we're created good, but we're fallen. 
The second thing is that we are a unity. Human beings, unlike any other animal, we are, or plant, we are a unity of body and soul. The body is physical, the soul is spiritual. The body can be observed, it can be measured, it can be weighed, it can be studied. The spirit, not so much, because it's uh, not a physical um, entity, but we are both things together united. And that's a very Christian way of looking at the human person. Our, because of this fallenness, our appetites, you know, our, our feelings are a little bit out of whack. Sometimes a lot out of whack. And that's a consequence of original sin. Our passions, we would say, are disordered. Sometimes we love things too much or we love them not enough. And we weren't made for that. But it is a consequence that we suffer now through sin. And we can work on it, and we must, and we do, especially during Lent, with the disciplines of Lent, of prayer and fasting and almsgiving. Third thing is that we are designed to be in communion with other people. We can't be ourselves alone. And this is one of the things that's been so stressful during this last year that we can't see anybody. We can't have dinner with anyone. We have to wear these masks and we have to maintain social distance. We were made to be in communion with each other. It is not good for the man to be alone. So God made a helpmate for the, for the, for the man. We are intrinsically social, like the Holy Trinity. It is in that way that we are perhaps most made in the image of God, in that we are made to be together. We find out who we are in communion with other people. So these three things about Christian anthropology were created good but were fallen. We are a unity of body and soul, but our Passions are subject to disorders. The third thing, we're designed to be in communion with others. It's a very countercultural view of who we are. Um, it's not unscientific, um, but it is very much looked down upon in certain segments of our society today. And the brokenness that we accept about ourselves and about our world. It just is. There's nothing anybody can do about it. The fundamental not-rightness of our world happened in the very beginning. And we have to face the reality of it. We have to accept it. Even as we try to work on it, we have to accept that, well, this is the way it is. And uh, this, this being limited, this sometimes feeling helpless, sometimes feeling frustrated, it's a part of life. And um, it's something that our Lord knew very well. He, until he became man and was born of the Virgin, he perhaps knew about helplessness, he knew about frustration. He knew about being limited, but he had never experienced it. This is why the Word became flesh. So that there's nothing that we experience where we could look at him and say, you don't know what this is like. He knows what this is like. Psalm 22 begins, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why so far from my call for help, from my cries of anguish? My God, I call by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I have no relief. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the glory of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you rescued them. To you they cried out, and they escaped. In you they trusted, and were not disappointed. 
But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They curl their lips and jeer. They shake their heads at me. He relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him. If he loves him, let him rescue him. For you drew me forth from the womb, made me safe at my mother's breasts. Upon you I was thrust from the womb. Since my mother bore me, you are my God. Do not stay far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. So now on to the second topic. You know, we can't stand outside the situations that need fixing, the situations that make us suffer. We can't stand outside those situations and judge them. Or at least we shouldn't if we're going to consider ourselves disciples of Jesus. If we believe in the doctrine of original sin, then we seek to engage these issues from inside of them because we realize that we share responsibility for the brokenness of the world. Um, Even if they're not our own individual fault, they're the fault of all of us together. And Jesus did not stand outside the world and judge it. He came into it and began fixing it from inside. He came down from heaven to earth to save us from ourselves, and it got him killed. Remember, he started praying Psalm 22, nailed to the cross. It sounds harsh, but this fact is really at the center of what Christians believe about the world, that Jesus loved it so much that he came into it to save it. So, There's this thing called nihilism, which is the rejection of all religious and moral principles in the belief that life is meaningless. So nihilism, it means like nothingness. And uh, one of its apostles is Friedrich Nietzsche, who said there are no facts, only interpretations. No facts, only interpretations. It's a philosophy that would say that nothing means anything. So there's nothing to believe in. If there are only interpretations and no facts, then your interpretation is as good as my interpretation. And the world is populated with experts sort of yelling at each other and throwing things at each other. And nobody is responsible for anything in a world like this where everybody's an expert and there are no facts, only interpretations, there's also no responsibility. It's always somebody else's fault. An Italian journalist has characterized nihilism as, I love this, a kind of intimacy with nothingness. Could anything be more empty than to be intimate with nothing? Nietzsche wrote this book, uh, this novel, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And uh, this character, Zarathustra, in the book, he talks about the Übermensch, the Superman, as a goal for humanity to set for itself because there is no God. And if there is no God, you have to make one. You have to make a superhero who's only human. And this is like, this becomes a goal for us to strive for, like we're going to save ourselves. And, and they multiply, as we've seen in the popular culture, Spider-Man, Batman, Catwoman, you know, all these bizarre fantasies, because you've stopped believing in God. But you have to invent something once you relegate God uh, to nothingness. It happens, when this happens, you don't need God anymore to set the bar for you, to show you where the danger lies, to inspire you to be virtuous and good. You have the power within us, according to this, that we have this intrinsic power to be good, which we don't have. But if you don't believe in God, you almost have to say that. The trouble with this philosophy is that it creates chaos. 
I believe it's created the chaos that we see in the world today. It's nothing new. If it were easy to believe that God is an all-good creator, that we are created as unity of soul and body by an all-good God, and that we have fallen from grace and need God and each other in order to be saved, if it were easy to believe that, the story of Adam and Eve wouldn't have been made into the first made it into the first four chapters of the book of Genesis, the story of how chaos threatened to ruin God's creation. More of Psalm 22. Many bulls surround me. Fierce bulls of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions that rend and roar. Like water, my life drains away. All my bones are disjointed. My heart has become like wax. It melts away within me. As dry as a pot shirt is my throat. My tongue cleaves to my palate. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, Lord, do not stay far off. My strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the grip of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my poor life from the horns of wild bulls. The third thing I want to talk about is responsibility. And this is where Psalm 22 turns the corner and starts looking at the hope that every person who knows and loves God has deeply rooted in their heart. Viktor Frankl was a psychologist who was a concentration camp survivor, and he wrote a very popular book called Man's Search for Meaning. A nihilist would say nothing means anything. Frankl and the people around him would say, if you, don't, if you aren't looking for meaning, if you aren't striving to find the meaning of your own life, that's real despair. Um, and you have a responsibility as a human, you and I. We have a responsibility to exercise our free will to work for that meaning uh, and, and to search for it in our life, especially in our relationship with God. The Lord wants us to relate to each other as brothers, and that's why he became our brother, so that we could relate to him in a very similar way that we relate to our own brothers and sisters in our family. Taking responsibility for our prayer life, for our works of charity, um, that all of those things mean something, that actually nothing, no, no thought, no movement of the heart, every single thing that we do, the Lord cares about. And if he cares about it, then it means something. It can contribute to the building up of the world. If I believe that his eyes are on me and he loves me and he wants me to work with him in the rolling back of that brokenness that is in the world. So for Frankel and his way of thinking, Real despair is when you tell somebody that the meaning of your life is in your career or in what you look like or the meaning of your life is uh, in how many followers you have on social media. They would say that's real despair to believe that. That's real hopelessness because you are bound to be let down. And um, we're setting people up for despair if we're feeding them that kind of worldview. And it's a crisis, especially for the young, because they know their lives aren't perfect. They can tell, you know, that they are limited, that, that they can't do it all, you know. And that sometimes they figure, well, since I'm not perfect, Perfection must not exist, which is the only conclusion you can make if you live in a culture that says there is no God. But if we do believe in God, 
if we do believe in a perfect being, then dealing with our own brokenness becomes possible because we know that even though we are responsible for the brokenness of the world, and even if we do have to take on the very painful job of being responsible for my own littleness, my own brokenness, I have a God who's perfect, who loves me, and who made me because he loves me. And he's calling me to live with him in the perfection of heaven. So, we are good, but we're broken. We're sinners, but we're in relationship to a God who loves us and who jumps down into the middle of our nothingness to tell us that we are loved. And the end of Psalm 22. Then I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the assembly I will praise you. All you who fear the Lord give praise. All descendants of Jacob give honor. Show reverence all descendants of Israel, for he has not spurned or disdained the misery of this poor wretch, did not turn away from me, but heard me when I cried out. I will offer praise in the great assembly. My vows I will fulfill before those who fear him. The poor will eat their fill. Those who seek the Lord will offer praise. May your hearts enjoy life forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations will bow low before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord, the ruler over the nations. All who sleep in the earth will bow low before God. All who have gone down into the dust will kneel in homage. And I will live for the Lord. My descendants will serve you. The generation to come will be told of the Lord that they may proclaim to a people yet unborn the deliverance you have brought. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.